Hi, my name's Floyd, and I'm giving the message uh, today. Um, thanks, Anton. <clears throat> you know, this week, <clears throat> sorry, my voice, I'm kind of losing my voice as well, so we can pray for that. Um, Denise had to get her phone replaced, and so this week we went to the mall, and before they give you the phone, they ask you to agree to all these terms and, and additions, uh, uh, conditions. And you've, you've done this, right? You, you go there and you scroll through it, agree, and scroll through it, agree, uh, yes, all these conditions. <clears throat> and as, as we're doing that, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I hope that I don't have to, I, there's no problem, and later they're going to have this is going to come back and, and get me. And so I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, I'm going to appeal to a higher authority at some point if there's a problem, maybe some court that says that that was unfair. Uh, but, but, you know, I think when we kind of look at what happens in this world, and maybe more recently if you watch the news, uh, the government is in a battle with Apple because the government is invoking a law from 1789 that says you have to open up access to a phone in order to get data that they suspect one of the criminals has. And so uh, Apple says, no, because we're going to, I'm going to trump you, I'm going to appeal to a higher authority, and that is the privacy of individuals. And so you cannot take this and, and, and force us to do this. And so they're in a deadlock now. And I was kind of thinking about this is, you know, if, if we are to live uh, in this world, which, what is the highest authority that we should live by? What is the authority that we need to appeal to in order to ensure that it trumps everything else? And that's going to be part of the message of what I give today in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians. So let's start by uh, asking the Lord in prayer. So if you would bow with me and ask him for uh, this time. Lord, <clears throat> Father, we just are grateful, Lord, that you did not just leave us here on our own, Lord, that you sent your Son, you sent your Holy Spirit, and on top of that, you gave us your word. And so, Lord, we have your word today to lead and guide us, and we have your Son and the Holy Spirit who are with us right now, Lord, to understand as we go through your word this morning. So I just pray that you would ready our hearts, Lord, open our ears this morning to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, if you recall, last week, Pastor Joe, uh, we were giving, going through this, this, um, the book of 1 Thessalonians, and Pastor Joe had mentioned that Paul has been traveling throughout Asia Minor, and he's gone through and <clears throat> he has stopped briefly in Thessalonica, and, and when he does that, he's, he preaches the word, but then the Jews, there's some Jews there that incite a mob to go and get Paul and kill him, and so what happens is the new believers there in Thessalonica, uh, you know, encourage and actually send Paul and Silas away, Paul and his companions, because they don't want them, for them to be, be caught and, and killed. And so Paul has actually moved on, and he's in a different town, and he writes back to the Thessalonians because he's concerned about them. And he writes back, and he says he wants to see how are they doing, especially since that Paul didn't really get to spend much time in Thessalonica. And, and let me just kind of mention also, just adding to Thessalonica, it's up in, in Upper Greece, and it's actually, you know, Thessalonica is not a small backwater town. It's actually, a, it was a very huge strategic for the Roman Empire. And it became one of those places where there's a lot of people, and there's a, there's a crossroads for people moving throughout the empire. And because of that as well, there were a lot of very uh, astute, critical thinkers over time. There were people from, there were Romans and Greeks and Jews that, that lived in this city. Now, it was a pretty big city. And what Paul also saw is that in Thessalonica when he got there, is that it was a place that had a lot of spiritual darkness. There, was, there were problems with uh, you know, many gods, ideologies, all these things, and, and all of that was competing for um, people's time and, and their beliefs. And so Paul has, has gone through and, and preached uh, the gospel into Thessalonica. Uh, so what we're going to do is, is we're continuing on this journey through First Thessalonians. I'm going to ask that we stand and, and read the passage that we're going to cover today. It's uh, found in chapter 2, verses six, 13 through 16. And it says, <clears throat> verse 13, And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not, it not as a human word, 
but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. You may be seated. You know, it's kind of interesting. And Paul, when he writes to the Thessalonians, um, he thanks God. He thanks God and says, we thank God. I pray for you and I thank God continually because you received this message from us and you saw it as the word of God. You know, Paul doesn't go in and talk about his life experiences, you know, things that he's done, and, and that becomes the thing that convinces the Thessalonians. It actually says it is God's word. But how, did, how did Paul do that? If we uh, look in Acts, this is a parallel account of when Paul is in Thessalonica, and he writes, or I should say Luke is actually writing the, the account of what's going on. Um, and if you go to Acts 17... It says, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, this is in Thessalonica, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Quote, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, unquote. And so what he's telling them is he shows them through scripture that this message that he's giving them is the word, word of God. And the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians believed and accepted. But, you know, I kind of wonder, it says, you know, that, that he shows them through Scripture. And we know that today that there's many claims about words from God. What is the Word of God? Is this truly the Word of God? Because there are other words that people claim came from God. Uh, a couple months ago, somebody came, two women came to my door, and uh, they asked me, uh, you know, I, I didn't really, I wasn't sure what, what they were doing there, but they said, hey, do you, have you, do you know God? Have you felt his presence? I said, yes, I do. I, I'm, a, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. Um, I, I believe that God's word is true. And they go, oh, that's great, because we believe God's word is true, too. Um, and they said, have you considered uh, the Book of Mormon? And they go, oh, Book of Mormon? Uh, no, I've heard about it. I've, I've actually have not read the Book of Mormon. And so they wanted me to, to, to know that this is really the words of God. And so I said, okay, well, I don't know that much about it, but I knew some things about, about Mormons. So I started to ask them, um, so you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Oh, yeah, we believe Jesus is, is. And do you believe he's equal? Yes, he's equal to the Father. And, and so as I started to ask them about that, I go, so how did, where did this book come from? And, and, of course, you know, they start to go through it. And, and if you read this book, and by the way, this book is called the Book of Mormon, and in small print, you will be able to see that. Well, he won't see it. But it says, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. It is not a supplement to the Testament of Jesus Christ. It's actually another Testament of Jesus Christ. Because when you read through this, and I've, I've started to read through some of this, it is completely different. And I'm not here to say, hey, is, is this true? I, I don't believe this is true. But how do we know that this is true? Right? Because this book has chapters and verses. It has pictures. It has, you know, they believe that, um, the Mormons believe that the true followers of, Je uh, of Jesus, or of God, left Israel, they came on barges, and they traveled to Central America. And from there, they're populated, and they are the true disciples of God. And, here's, and, and they also believe that Jesus, after he ascended into heaven, he reappeared in Central America to prove that he was God. And so here's actually a picture. You won't be able to see that. But here's Jesus among the native Indians in Central America, proclaiming and proving that he is God. And so, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking to them, you know, I'm, I'm asking, so... You believe the Bible, but, but there's, I've read through this, and there is nothing in here that 
talks about this. Why is this so different? And they try to explain that this is, this is new revelation. And, this, and, and what they don't really say, and this is what Mormons believe, if you really get down to it, is they believe that this book is, has been corrupted, that there are errors in this book, and therefore there is a new revised information that came about Jesus Christ. Right? But they won't, be, they won't say that. And so one of the things that, that as I was kind of going through that, and I said, well, how do you know that this is true? And, 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 and because there's no evidence, there's never been any evidence, corroborating evidence, that the stories in here have been found to be true. No archaeological uh, digs, no historical facts, nothing that can point to the stories in here that claim that it's true. And when I press them, their answer is, well, you have to believe. And I know that when I read, that deep down in my heart, I know it's true. And so when you hear that, we go, is that good enough? Right? But I would ask you, what makes this true? Right? And if your answer, if somebody asks you, is this true? If you say, well, I know that it's true because someone has told me or because I feel that it's true, is that enough? And is that going to be enough to be the authority in your life? What, what difference is this going to make if, you, if both people are saying the same thing? Here's the thing that we need to, to understand. If you go to the next slide, is that God, in his word, he reveals himself and his creation to us. Now, I'm not going to spend time here explaining to you why I believe that this is true, right? Because we're not going to have time. But I will say that there has never been any proof that the things that are in this book have been proven false or in error. Never. And I would venture to say that it will never be found to be in error or false. Because it is accurate, it's consistent. There are so many things about this, and if you spend time in the Word, you'll see that there, this is like no other book. No other book that's ever been written. But there's more than just saying that this is the Word of God, because people say, that's the Word of God. I think the difference is that when you start to read this, it teaches us about ourself, our true condition, that before we come and understand who Christ is, that we are lost and that we are spiritually dead. That is our true condition because of our sins. And we needed someone who's going to come and pay the penalty of that sin. And this is this person named Jesus Christ who is both God and man. And he comes and dies for our sins so that we can have a relationship with him. And then he gives us the Holy Spirit. He sends the Holy Spirit who indwells us to help transform us so that our hearts and the things that we desire are the things that God desires and that we honor him in our lives. That is the good news, and that is not found in other books. It is the gospel, the good news, that is, makes this book so different. And this is what Paul is, he, he tells the Thessalonians, he reasons with them, and he goes through scriptures, and he shows them that the Messiah is Jesus Christ. Right? There's no other book that claims that, that does that, no other book that says that Jesus is God and that he came for us. Now, some of you may say, well, I don't know if I agree with everything that's in here. And, and I would say that, and this is one, one Bible scholar says, that if you take this book, and if God is truthful, there's two ways that we approach this when we say we don't agree. One of them is lack of understanding, and the other is disbelief. Now, with lack of understanding, this is where Paul has gone to the Thessalonians, and he's explained and showed them, and they got it, and he said, okay, it makes sense. It, it, I, I see that... This is the word of God. But there are others that it talks about in the verses we read that come with a heart of disbelief. 
<clears throat> and not only disbelief, but they are hostile to Paul and the new believers. And they're hostile to anyone who is, wants to be open to the, the word and, and the truth. The thing is, is you can see that um, people, when, when you bring this book and explain and try to, to reason with them, it, 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 it's difficult because we know that when we say we believe this, something happens to us. When we say that we have received and, and we want to be in a relationship with God, something not only something doesn't change in this book. What happens is it changes us, right? That we receive the Holy Spirit. And at that point, then we, God says he gives us a new heart. He changes our disposition and desires for him. And if we proclaim that this is the good news and that Jesus is God and King, then every other religion and ideology and everything else becomes invalid, right? Because there is no applying and saying that both of these are true. Only one can be true. And it also tells the Thessalonians that not only is God your king and Lord, but this is your highest authority. This becomes your highest authority. And not even Caesar has authority over God and his word. What happens is when... when Thessalonians, they, they see that, they understand it, they live, they want to live the word. They are opposed. They are, these people are coming after them and because they want to silence the gospel, right? Paul says, they try to do, you know, don't be surprised. What you're going through is exactly what the early churches in Judea went through because when they proclaimed Jesus, they were attacked. The Jews there tried to silence the gospel, right? They killed Jesus and the prophets and they drove us out of there. Because something happens when we step forward and come and say that we are now, we now belong to Christ, that we are now in a different kingdom. Have you had anything like that in your life? When you proclaim the gospel, have you received opposition, hostility? And, and Paul talks about it. He says, don't be surprised that the opposition is coming from your own countrymen, it's coming from people you know, it's coming from people that you grew up with. And that's one of the things that, that makes it very, very difficult is these people who know you, family, are typically the ones that will come against you. And Paul says, don't be surprised. That happens. I, I, I grew up in a Christian home. I didn't really get necessarily that kind of attack by personal family, but I know of a brother I'm going to call up here to share with us, he and um, many of you know, that he's actually had to go through some very, very tough times with his family. So if you would, um, yeah, just encourage him. I'm just kind of walk, going to go through some, some of the things that, that he went through. Um, thanks, Ian. And, you know, there's a couple of us uh, that used to meet with him on Saturdays over at Starbucks and Patrick and Curtis, and, you know, we've, we've heard and gone through the, the stories that, that he's go, been going through as it was happening. It was just so amazing of, of what God has been doing uh, through Hien's life and his family. So, yeah, so uh, Hien, um, you grew up in a Buddhist family, uh, and I would say maybe staunch Buddhist, but what was that, what was that like, and what, is that, what did it mean when you then became a Christian? So I grew up uh, in a family that we can trace back to six generations of Buddhism. And as my journey with uh, the Lord grew, uh, it came to a decision point uh, back in 98 where I had to choose, do I pursue God, uh, who I know is true, or do I continue on with uh, Buddhism, and, which for me is really more of a cultural religion rather than a, a true spiritual religion. Uh, and so when the decision point came in 98 and I had to make that choice, uh, I loved God more than anything or anybody else. And so I chose God. And when that happened, uh, my entire family and social uh, world collapsed all around me. 
Uh, I essentially became nobody to everybody I knew and grew up with. Uh, my family uh, disowned me, uh, and all of my childhood friends that I grew up who were really close to me uh, no longer recognized me or accepted me or wanted to associate with me because they saw me as someone who uh, is very shameful, uh, mm -hmm. someone who is very, in their minds, dirty, uh, and therefore not to be associated with or contacted with. Wow. <clears throat> now, you mentioned that um, you've kind of felt like this outcast for many, many years since 1998, and then something happened fairly recently with your grandparents. Um, and also, you, you kind of explained that maybe also that you were in, in your family, it was the patriarchal line that was coming through your family, your grandfather, your dad, and then you, and then once you decided that you wanted to be a Christian, you were not uh, authorized, or you weren't going to be in the patriarchal line that carries the name of, of Dao. Yeah, so um, being a, a very uh, strict uh, cultural uh, family, uh, my grandfather is the, the oldest son of an oldest son. So all through the generational lines, uh, I belong to a line of oldest sons. And so my grandfather is the oldest son, my dad is the oldest son, and then my brother is the oldest son, and I am the, the younger of the two. Uh, so when I received Christ, uh, that brought so much embarrassment and so much shame and dishonor to the family uh, that they had, you know, they, they ostracized me, they separated so that they can distance themselves from me. So even though there was a lot of embarrassment in the community and, uh, and throughout our family in, uh, in the, throughout the world, um, they had to do that to distance themselves from me, not only because they didn't believe what I was doing was right, but also as a cultural familial thing. Um, you know, it, it was such a huge um, embarrassment and shame to the family that my, my grandfather said that uh, my actions, what I did, uh, brought so much dishonor and so much shame to the family that I was the very one black mark that completely destroyed the family name uh, and the family line. And so that was the guilt and the burden that I carried uh, all those years because I felt just the heaviness knowing that I was the reason why the family name and the family line um, was so looked down upon now. Um, after six generations of quote unquote being upright. I mean, what happened to your grandfather? I mean, the one that called you a black mark, something happened, and he's, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, you know, God is so good. Uh, he sees and knows everything, and, and He brings all of the things that we go through uh, to redemption and uses it for His purpose. Uh, and so, even though um, I was disowned uh, after a period of almost five years of no contact. Uh, my father was on the verge of possibly dying um, from a heart attack. And so my brother said, okay, Hen, it's time for you to come home to you know, show uh, your presence to your dad. Uh, and that was the beginning of my reintegration to the family. Uh, and so slowly over the years after that, it was a very slow, gradual process of reintegration to the family. Uh, and through those times, um, I had a chance to share with them the good news, share with them about Jesus. Uh, and there was just, just a lot of opposition. Um, you know, they said that do not ever mention God or Jesus, because if you do, then we're just going to, again, we're going to ostracize you. Um, and my uncle was, my dad's younger brother was the most vocal, uh, and he would slap me across the face uh, to shut me up because he says, don't you dare mention God or Jesus in front of us. Um, but through all of that, God redeemed everything because my grandfather was there. He heard and he saw everything. And then at the, towards the end of his life, when he was in the hospital, um, God really orchestrated situations where I was able to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with him and I was able to share. And he just patiently listened and listened and listened. Not only, you know, did, you know, John 3, 16 uh, was shared and the full gospel was shared, but for a Buddhist, sin is really heavy. Unlike Christianity where Jesus forgives us of our sin, in Buddhism, sin is not forgiven. Sin is carried with you. You live with your sin. 
uh, and sin affects you and how you are reincarnated into the next life. And so for my grandfather, sin is a really, really heavy uh, topic. And so when I share with him not only the gospel, but for example, in Romans, um, you know, that uh, God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The fact that somebody died for our sins really touched my grandfather's heart. Mm. It really ignited a desire to want to know more, to want to know who is this Jesus, who is God. Uh, and then, you know, to understand and to share with him in Vietnamese, for the wages of sin is death. Uh, but God, you know, um, the, the gift of, of God is, is life eternal in Christ Jesus. I mean, those are really scriptural words that really touched his heart and ignited this desire to know. And as he wanted to know more, I was able to share more freely, and he just soaked up the words. He soaked up the, the, the Bible because I gave him the Bible in Vietnamese, and he was able to read it and really understood uh, as much as he could what, what the true living word is. Uh, and that it was at that point where in his own brokenness, in his own realization of his own sin, that he understood the meaning and the power of why Jesus came and why he died for us. And throughout that time of about four to six, four to five weeks in the hospital, from the first time I shared with him uh, to the point of towards the end of his life, he accepted and received Christ. Yeah, amen. Now, your uncle, who was the most vocal and opposed to you, um, how did what happened now with him? Your, your grandfather, who's the line, receives Christ. And so your, your uncle, who's not in the line, but has a lot of influence, what does he do? <clears throat> and so after my grandfather received Christ, my uncle um, really attacked me and verbally and said that I had brainwashed him, I had taken advantage of his ailing situation to brainwash and propagandize and all of these other words that he used. Uh, but again, God redeemed everything. He really wanted to touch uh, the family. And so not only did God bring my grandfather to Christ, uh, roughly two months later, my grandmother came to Christ because he and my, uh, and my grandmother spent a lot of time sharing and talking. Mm -hmm. And after he received Christ, he shared with my grandmother a lot of things that he never shared with her uh, throughout their entire marriage of, of over 60 years. And for her to hear what he shared and the truth behind it and the love behind it and the heart behind it, she wanted to know more about this, this Jesus Christ uh, and who God is and who it, Jesus is. And that led her to accept and receive Christ. So when my uncle heard that both his mother and his father received Christ, uh, it could not be me propagandizing and brainwashing my grandmother. He had to find out the truth. He had to find out why this happened and how could this ha have happened. And so this began this journey of him wanting to know more. And for a man, a very proud, righteous man to come to me and ask, I mean, that was a huge step that I thought would never happen. And so uh, it was a journey of him and me just talking and sharing and opening up. And through months and months and months of talking and sharing and me visiting him in Toronto and him coming over to San Francisco uh, and me coming down there, uh, again, God moved so powerfully in him that he could not deny any longer who this God is that his parents accepted, who this Jesus Christ is that so affected uh, and so transformed them that he himself asked for prayer to receive Christ. And? <laughs> and <laughs> um, after that, he began a process of transformation, and it is a transformation that is so starkly 180, so unbelievable that people did not even know who this person is anymore. Mm. Um, his, his wife was like completely just shocked at the change in his demeanor. 
in how he treated her, in how he became more of a husband in that very short period of time than their entire uh, you know, 30 something plus years of marriage. His daughters did not even recognize who their father is anymore. And they called me up and jokingly said, what did you do to our father? I said, I didn't do anything. God moved, I mean, God transformed his heart and his mind. Uh, and so um, out of that transformation and out of that, that just change in his heart and how he became, um, his wife was also curious, wanted to know more, wanted and desired to have that same life, have that same freedom, have that same just love for, for life. And we, be, we started the process of, of just sharing and communicating and, uh, and um, my uncle and I spent a lot of time with her also uh, in, the wor- in the word and she also then uh, received Christ. Wow. Uh, and most recently, their daughter and her husband saw the transformation in their parents and, the, and in their marriage. They saw the complete radical shift in how they treated each other and what a marriage looks like and what a marriage that is Christ-based looks like. Uh, that both of them, when I was in Toronto a couple of weeks ago, um, I had the privilege of praying for both my cousin and her husband to receive Christ. So um, it's been an amazing journey of God redeeming uh, through everything. And as you know, Elder Floyd was, was saying earlier, um, you know, you have to stand, you have to, to stand firm that there is persecution, there is a lot of people who are gonna attack you and, and, and be against you. And the enemy is gonna discourage you and say, you know, this is too hard, this is too tough, I don't wanna deal with this anymore. Um, but please, please stand firm in knowing that if God is for you and God is with you, then who can be against you? What can, can stand against you? And you have to truly believe and not be discouraged that people can shout names at you, people can hit you, people can slap you, people can ostracize you, people can you know, do whatever, but if you stand firm in God and truly believe that God is for you and God is for your family, he wants salvation for your family, you gotta persevere, you gotta persevere because God will redeem your perseverance, God will redeem your heart and your love for him and he will bring to completion what you started. Amen, amen, what a blessing. Thank Thank you, brother. Now we have the benefit of seeing the outcome. But, you know, we prayed for him through this, this trials he was going through. It was so, so hard. You know, and the thing is, he mentioned that he had been labeled as the black mark in his family. And, you know, we prayed that, that he would be the person that changes the entire tide of the family. That through him, it just takes one to, to shift generations of, of hate and hostility towards the gospel. And the thing we used to pray is that we used to tell him, it's like, Ken, you are one, but you are one and you have the Holy Spirit. They don't have a chance. <laughs> All you need is one. You just need that one, the Holy Spirit with you, and they have no idea what they're up against. Now, I'm not saying that it's not going to be uh, hard. It is very, very hard. But if we allow the Holy Spirit to say, this is what I want to use you in a face of opposition Man, it, anything, anything is possible. Well, let me uh, continue on through, through the rest of this. And, and that is, you know, when we, when we have this opposition, uh, what, do we, what do we do? Now, if you kind of put up the next slide, Paul it tells the Thessalonians, don't worry, that these people that are going to come against you, not only come against you, but they're also going to, as I mentioned, block that message from getting to anyone else that they are going to be hostile and they displease God. And God knows. And it says that their sin, it continues to heap judgment upon judgment upon judgment on them. God knows. And God's in control. And he tells them that this is what you should do, you Thessalonians as new believers, that this is how you respond and react to the word of God. That we are continuing to spread the gospel, that we go out in humility and love for the people, that we honor God when we do that, and we enjoy peace with God when that happens. But here's kind of the key to what Paul is really kind of saying. What Paul doesn't tell the Thessalonians is he doesn't tell them, run away from the opponents or pick up your 
our, uh, your, your, your uh, weapons, and you need to go into battle against the opponents of Christ. What Paul tells them is that they need to know who they are and that they need to follow what God wants them to do through the gospel. Paul says that these people that are the opponents of Christ are not the real enemy. They are in some sense the enemy, but they are living in a world of blindness and darkness. They do not see what reality is. And Paul tells them that it is our responsibility when we go and share the gospel that actually we should be going to these very people that oppose us. And this is something that is very, very hard. This is so hard to be able to go to and reach out to the people that are there to try and kill you. They're trying to kill Paul. How does Paul, why does Paul say that to the Thessalonians, that we should have compassion on them? Paul can say this is because Paul was in the left column. Paul was Saul of Tarsus. Paul was the most feared persecutor of Christians in his life. He killed and murdered Christians. He was there to oppose the gospel until he met Christ. Right? And so Paul tells us that we should, if we are to follow the gospel, and if we are to live by the word, that we as servants look at, look at people the same way that God does, and that these people that are on the left need Christ. And we should be able to do that in face of severe opposition. That is, is who we go after. Uh, I'm going to invite the, uh, the worship team to, uh, to come up on stage. And I'm just kind of close uh, with this. Uh, this year, you know, we as a church have committed that we want to take the commission of, that, that Jesus gave us to heart. And Matthew 28 is a verse that, that we... <clears throat> Are responding to. And you notice that when, when we, and we've had this as part of our memory verse, it says that we are to go and make disciples of all nations, that baptize them in the name of the Father and Son. And that is to bring, to go out and preach the gospel, to bring people into the kingdom of God. But, you know, the last part is the part that, something that we actually have to really take to heart, and that is teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. One of the ways that we're going to try and do this as a church is that we want to actually go out and meet with people that have not read the word. And we want to be able to say, we want to read the scriptures with you. And we want to be able to explain and go through scriptures. And we're going to use the, the gospel of John uh, for this. And we believe that the power of God's word, just as he and it shared, it does something when we not only read through it, but it, you know, if we try to use it and explain it to them, something happens uh, to people uh, with God's word. I would say also that uh, if you have not read this book, that, <clears throat> that you at least have an open mind to be able to say, okay, I, I will take a chance and read this to see if that this is really just human words or if there's something altogether different about this book. Uh, the two women who left this book with me what they asked me is that, okay, I would just ask you that you read this with an open mind. And what we'd like to do is come back uh, later and just kind of check up on you and see what you thought. And I said, okay, yeah, I, I will do that. I will do that because I don't know this book. And I should at least say firsthand what this book says. Not, I, I've read through some of it and, and it still has no effect on me, but it's just, it's just, it's a good, it's, it's a fun read. Um, <laughs> But what I, what I ask them is that you come back and what I'd like you to do is that we open up this book and I want us to go through and read through this and, and I want you to be able to see what I believe and what I see as the testament of Jesus Christ. And they said, yes, okay, we'll, we'll do that. They haven't been back yet, but um, I'm praying that, that they would come back and that we get a chance to go through, through this book. And so I'm asking that if you haven't read this book, that did you just kind of have maybe that open mind? And, and then the last thing is that if you are a believer and, and this path that we're on and we're going to read this, and it, read this book and explain it, if it intimidates you and in saying, I don't know if I can do that, 
couple of things. One of them is you cannot do this on your own. You have to go to the author of Scripture, which is the Holy Spirit, and you say, I need you to help me to get through this and to help see the insights and explain that. And I would say the other thing is, is that we have each other. Uh, we should be spurring each other on. We, we're going to go through this as a church. We're not saying go out there. We're going to offer some classes. We're going to use this as, just as Paul did, to show that this is, this is true and it has power. And I would ask that we all as a church should step up to that. You know, Jesus didn't say, pick up your crutch and follow me. He says, pick up your cross and follow me. It, it's going to be hard. But he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. This is my word. Take it with you. So uh, let me close in, in prayer. Lord, we, <clears throat> Lord, as I mentioned, we are so grateful, Lord, for your word, Lord. Your word is is true, Lord. Your message matters, Lord, because you matter. You are the one true and faithful, Lord. Lord, and we know that as we go through this, as we look and read the gospel, that, that it isn't just a story, Lord, that, it, that lives matter, and, and lives are, are hanging in the balance. And, and time is slipping away, Lord, and we need your help, Lord. And so I just pray that, that you would help us Lord, to believe in your promises, Lord, to fall in your grace, and, Lord, to be able to tell others that we proclaim that this Jesus, Lord, is the Messiah. You are the one, Lord, that we bow to. We give all honor and authority to you, Lord. In Jesus' name.